Now, the moment we've been waiting for, for the longest time, I, Lawrence Ceres, have been talking about launching the Punchline podcast. As you know me, um, I've been a journalist for over a decade, and I've always been dealing with issues of uh, national interest, policy development, uh, social development, and all the likes. But let me tell you one-on-one, -on -one, I couldn't wait for any moment than today to work and to launch and to interview people on this podcast. But before we go further, let me introduce you first to what this is about. The Punchline podcast aims to tackle global issues affecting Botswana and its diverse society through social stories, basically. The aim is to advance policy development, discuss gender issues, promote human rights, and empower people socioeconomically through thought-provoking dialogues. The conversations that you and I, you are part of the conversations as the audience, uh, you can comment, you can do whatever, but we will lead from here as we give direction into these conversations. Basically, they are meant to inspire you, especially the youth. We want to cover topics like the economy, politics, culture, entrepreneurship, technology, and tourism, and everything else that matters, more especially about your happiness as a Mutsuan. The goal really is to motivate our listeners to take actions for change by sharing these underreported stories from Botswana and the region at large. So today in the Punchline podcast, um, we have a phenomenal, phenomenal woman joining us, Riki um, Kositao. If you don't know her, today is the day. Because our podcast really tries to feature leading thinkers from different fields of government, corporate, <clears throat> academia, sports, arts, or activists who may sometimes disagree on viewpoints and all the likes. But it is through these misconceptions that we can dispel Botswana's aspirations for the future. So, here is a new place of our gathering which is going to be happening from here now onwards. This is for seekers of knowledge. Welcome to the Punchline Podcast. My name is Lawrence Serret. So, today in the studio of the Punchline Podcast, I'm joined by uh, Tsepo Rikikosita. Tsepo is an LGBTQI <coughs> activist. She's also an executive director of the Global Equality Caucus, an international network of parliamentarians, an elected representative dedicated to tackling discriminations against LGBTQI people. Hosi Tao, a Botswana transgender woman, has been influential in promoting LGBTQI rights and inclusion in Botswana and beyond. How are you, Ricky? I'm excited to be here. I'm happy at the fact that we eventually got to pin this day down. Yo. It's, it's been, yeah, <laughs> a long time in the making, really. It's, it's been a smack. It's a bit of weeks, ne? Yeah. Yeah. You, so. you went to, to, to all these places, bo, what do you call the desert place? Yeah, we did the desert And we've been waiting friends. for you. Look at the team and the whole setup. The way is Ricky? When is Ricky coming no, through? The universe can I for the greater good. I mean, really, to have even the time to be at home now has yeah. been a blessing. So I'm happy that we get to do this, actually. So oh. I'm excited. Oh, fantastic. I don't know. Uh, today, I'm, I'm having wine. Uh, before we go into this, mm -hmm. I don't know what you are having, but it looks like a whistle. What do you call this? Some bubbly. It's a spritzer, if I can put it that way. So it's a baby of wine yeah. that with some bit of bubbles, not as much as an MCC or a champagne. Oh. So it's a border. I, I should I should try me one of these. You should uh, when we are done. Definitely I wouldn't mind sharing. But because we have limited time, I want us to go straight into our issues. I know we've been talking for a while. I've been working with you for over eight to something years yeah. when I was uh, editor of the Botswana Gazette and you used to write a column called Queer, Queer Eye. Eye. Of singular eye and not the eye, although it was denoting the eye perspective. <laughs> yes. Uh, your writings were um, something <clears throat> I've never come across before. They were insightful. They were educative. 
they were taking me into a spear, into an ozone of uh, something that I really didn't know. And as a seeker of knowledge, um, I know we've been eight years and I was learning quite a lot from your writings uh, as a columnist back when we were with the gender, is it gender equality, right? I was with account, gender dynamics before. Gender dynamics. Even in transition, we were still doing the column as I was with Accountability yes, International. and Accountability International, which yeah. I think I got a nomination for something Yes, for. you did, anyway. for an Accountability <laughs> Leadership Award. Yes, yes. Because it, it, it's exactly that. It was around recognizing Africans and really globally even which is pushing to be able to continuously push for agendas that are really pushing for accountability. Yes. And recognition of yeah, different kind of perspectives. And 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 that was that was amazing work that I saw. And it didn't there. come from me. I wasn't allowed to nominate. I was the executive director, so don't think that it, there was any bias. I wasn't aware. <laughs> I'm just was, putting it out there. <laughs> Because oh, somebody might just think that maybe you <laughs> yeah. got that nomination over the fact that we were working together. I had to recuse myself from the process. Yeah. No, I figured out. Yeah. I was in that way. But before we go further, let's start with the fundamentals. Uh, can you break down for our listeners what LGBTQI represents? And correct me where I'm wrong, mm -hmm. what it represents. I think we need to start with the basics. Absolutely. Yes. And I think it's always a good question, but then after years of doing, I think now well over 10 years as well of doing LGBT activism, it's what we call LGBTI 101, and at times I, I yeah, the basics, the fundamentals, yes, yes, like yes. you say. LGBTI 101. Yes, 101. Uh, like um, 101, what, what yes. are these? What's this acronym itself? Yeah. Because many a times I just delve into a conversation around what needs to be done to make the lives of LGBTI people better. Yeah. So many a times people are accustomed to the G in that LGB, which denotes gay people or yeah. gay men, who are men who identify as men, yes. and they love other men. Mm -hmm. And then the L at the very beginning denoting lesbians, yes. which are people who identify as women who are attracted to other women. It's not just sexual, but spiritually, emotionally, romantically, um, and can commit to relationships with other women. And then you've got the B that often is somebody, the other day I read an article that was saying the B is the stepchild of the LGBTI community. What? Because it's, it's that really often the invisibilized and not really spoken about child of this big brand. But bisexuals are individuals who are attracted to both genders in the binary of oh, the sense, okay. but not necessarily concurrently in relationship with men and women, because that's often the misconstrued ideal around. Or oh, they, they, they change when they change. They, change they can they change. be with a man and then they can be with a woman, yeah. both in not really, concurrently, not concurrently yeah. but in, in committed relationships with, with either the same gender or mm. the opposite gender to, the, to their own. Mm. And then you've got the T, which denotes, which is how I identify. So when you look at the LG, B more especially, you end there with the LGB, you're looking at things that have to do with sexual orientation, romantic attraction, um, relationshiping. Mm. And then you come to this T and I, uh, transgender as a part of this LGBTI acronym, mm. denotes individuals who are born with a certain particular sex assignment at birth that they don't identify with and then take measures to be able to really bring that innate or internal sense of their gender to be in congruence with the outward appearance mm. or the kind of official gender conferred on them being able mm. to align with the one that they identify with internally. To break it down, Transgender persons are often known as people who undergo gender affirmation surgery or gender affirmation processes. Previously, people would say a sex, sex reassignment, you don't reassign somebody's sex because mm. sex is yeah, a myriad of determinants. And that's how then it interlinks to even intersex individuals who, mm. by virtue of birth and biological construct, they have traits that are male and female conflating in the same exact body. So you can't necessarily put them in a in, in female or a male category. Mm. I think we can narrate the experiences of people like Casta Semenya, for instance, on her fight against the International Athletics Federation, inclusive of locally Paul Sotlachumarama, all that began in 2009 around individuals who their bodies don't fit these neat boxes of male and female. 
-hmm. and ideally then they become what we call intersex or they are what we call intersex in that it's an interconflation of male and female characteristics. So when you look at it, much as the LGBTI acronym might seem to seek to describe a community of people that in Zona it's often too generic. Yeah, I was going to ask in, in, in this intersex, Zona kind yes. of uh, understanding and comfort for him. Um, how do you simplify it down? I, I yeah. get it, I understand, because maybe I've been exposed in reading yes, and, and working exactly. with people and just trying to keep my level, uh, my mind level ahead yeah. to understand what this means. But for a Mutswana Hela who just don't understand, how do we simplify that kind that of understanding? Them, it, it, it obviously has to be as owning to the fact that there's been language that's been violent that has existed mm -hmm. to define and to label and categorize it in subsects of community. So on the one end, yes, you can talk about the LGB as Batubaratanangabung mm -hmm. or to relate to Khorbaratanajang. Yes. But then the T and I, you're talking about bo. Jamoto, uh -huh. of which previously you would find that intersex and transgender persons Kasuzana, were just classified together and lumped together as Trasi, uh -huh. which was just a, a, an African's borrowed term uh -huh. to denote people by Lenghore, Bongja Bone, somehow there is a, a, a material change yeah, or there is a conflation yeah, that yeah, creates yeah. an ambiguity. Mm. So that's what then the T and I denote a transgender person and unlike an intersex person. Mm. There is no conflation of, of male and female characteristics. Mm. It's more of an internal sense of gender identity is as finally what is conferred on the outside. And then an intersex person is where biologically, phenotypically, you find that there is male and female characteristics on the same body. Like having the yeah, both. It, yes. it, it, it might be that where one mm. is more pronounced than the other yes. and then that denotes the ambiguity. But then Lawrence, they, they, so there's then 96 the, ways the, the in which intersex bodies person gets to sky. choose themselves which one weighs more than the other. Beyond choice, it's a thing mm. of them growing naturally into, into it. it. Because I do mm. think that every single person, a little boy who's like four or five years will tell you that they're a boy. It's, it's not a choice they've made. They just uh -huh. identify that way. Yeah. So it's, it's why even in the international human rights space, we've fought so hard mm. to be able to even see things like your resolution 522 from the African Union that came mm. out the other day, protecting inter intersex persons mm. from what we call intersex genital mutilation. Because a lot of intersex people end up having to be forcibly um, done surgeries on at birth to mm. try and somewhat correct that ambiguity mm. but that assignment can be wrong before we go Terribly. there because we are going to definitely yeah, have that discussion the... i want to start with you because uh, you, you my friend yeah uh, and we've worked quite a long time yep. you and i have never had the opportunity to have this, to have this conversation <laughs> you've always bombarded me with this knowledge which i understood you from 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 the pen and and from yeah, our conversations leadership. but i would yeah. like to take this opportunity Hella, to allow you to tell me about your journey as an as an activist yeah. uh in this area and how you became involved in advocating for gender rights so for me my activism began in the opposite way it was gender activism and children's mm. rights activism mm. because i was in primary that i remember very well that we had something called the girl boy education movement mm. it was a little school initiative that was founded by unicef at the time mm. so they had these child rights like ambassadors in primary schools so i was at Masai at the time and what we were meant to do so we were somewhat of prefects but also psychosocial support structures mm -hmm. that were peer-to-peer -peer led. Mm -hmm. So ours was to identify ways in which as students who was other peers of ours who were struggling in the school setting and ways in which we could be able to continuously somewhat have a buddy system that we could support each other because we, in the time that I was still in primary, we were coming from different backgrounds. I personally was coming from an abusive family background that ultimately led to a divorce of my parents. And then there were other kids who were coming from impoverished backgrounds where they would come to school with nothing to eat but afraid to tell teachers mm. 
mm. that kana kitsugile kwa lapeng go sena se pese ke se jam but they could tell a peer mm. and then that is how we would convey that information to to maybe teachers or other primary points of contact so it it began from that and then as a kid who was a the only girl to my mother still am really the only girl to my mother and then seeing her go through her own experiences of an abusive marriage when she was very young my mother got married at like the age of 19 she was mm. really really young still very submissive really very much a child who was just thrown into this responsibility of an adult and of a wife and then having to really understand the vulnerabilities of women and girls mm. so a lot of our work with the gbm movement then started also then to grow into the particular vulnerabilities of girls and of women wait, and, wait. Yeah. you're saying primary school and then gbm movement gbm um, movement was the girl boy education movement oh back in back primary, in primary. Okay, okay so i i grew from a child rights activism mm -hmm. backdrop into a gender and women and girls rights kind okay. of environment so even then my own narrative as a transgender child and as a transgender girl at primary it got conflated with when did you discover that you are a transgender i knew i was a girl i didn't know i was transgender i just knew i was a girl at the, oh, in when, standard when five yes, yes. yes. Oh. so and it took an, an, an incredible teacher in my life Mema Sotre, at the time oh. she was studying towards a bachelor in childhood development psychology mm. so she had come across these kind of concepts around childhood gender development so she's the first person who really to me outside of my own family was able to say in a school setting I can tell you're not a boy, but what is it that you are? And all I could tell her was that I was a girl, and then I was told I was not a girl. So she was the first kind of buffer that existed that allowed me to be able to explore this identity and to explore myself. So is it the traditionalistic thing that uh, people who were telling you that they are not a girl were basically basing on, what, what were they basing that on? as opposed to the teacher now try to understand mm. exactly the question you say that she was asking then what what are you yeah as opposed to those who are telling you what you are what, I should what were be. those basing it on it was i think on on the normative of the knowledge that males become boys females become girls mm. and then a boy grows to become a man a girl grows to become a woman so i kind of then was a being that conflated those spaces. Yes. The, I would the like clean to understand space this. in between the two. Yes. I would like to understand this journey between you and your teacher after she asked that question and then you guys are walking through this. Yeah. At, at what point do you both maybe find realization of maybe, I don't know, where we are today? Yeah. What are the reactions? What are the feelings? It, it, was, it was a mix of things. I mean, for the first time, my mother was given opportunity to be able to really speak about how she was raising me at home. Okay. So my mother had created an environment from the age of 10 where I could be able to choose my toys, I could choose what I wanted to wear, I was allowed to play with Barbie dolls, I was allowed to experiment with makeup. So all of those things denoted a certain kind of gender environment in which I was just ideally like any other of the girls in my family. But then there was this performativity that I was expected at school that nobody had ever sat down with any of my parents, except in preschool, Kokreshe. I remember when my mom and my stepdad were asked by a teacher who said to them, please go and talk to your child because every single time the girls were told to go to a toilet, I would be going with the girls. Every single time we were in a playground, the role that girls would take in any kind of play role Mm -hmm. I would be taking that and that's the first time that my parents were actually confronted by a teacher or an, an, an educator to say can you go in and in that one it wasn't of can you let us know about the child it was more prescriptive that yeah. go and fix your child because oh. then it, she's a troublemaker every single time we are trying to sort out these clean lines between boys and girls mm. there she is goes and crosses awesome. them so go and fix the child so it was more prescriptive yeah um and it didn't give them a conversational kind of platform so muscle when i was in standard five mm. was the very first time now that my mother was now separated from her ex-husband at the time that she was given opportunity to say we i don't understand i want you to tell me a little bit about even the environment that this child is growing up at at home so it was the first time that a teacher then got to be able to marry mm -hmm. what 
I express myself as Moskolong mm. versus what is it that so they it, understood it meant was that her, a home her environment. engagement with, with, with your mother also actually gave her an opening to understand that. So let's track back a little yeah. bit. Uh, your parents or your mother in that case, um, they long understood and, and how was it like and what was the conversation to you? It started off rough and violent, let me be honest, because they tried to make a boy out of me. Oh. So for the first 10 years of my life, I can honestly tell a person, my whole entire family in the Khosita Utlan itself, inclusive of my mother, they tried to raise a boy out of me. So it took them close to a decade for them to give up and go like, we are literally forcing something that's never going to happen. Yes. Because the more they tried to raise this boy out of me, the more a girl continued to grow out of that. So they had to because then... Because that's basically yeah, who That's you who are. I am yeah. and that's what I was born as. Mm. So it's only, I think, after experiences such as my uncles having sent me mm. to go and fetch. There was like, I remember one incident with my second uncle, Malmimi Dupi that he was looking for one of these young bulls that was just really just uncontrollable. So it had a tendency of just forever just going into the wild. So to find it, it required a bit of like trekking in order to find it. How were you feeling at the time? Abused. I mean, oh, okay. Yeah, I just felt abused. I remember after that day, because my mom had taken us to Barlom Farms on a school holiday. Yeah. So it was the time where there were those public phones that you could slot a little 25 tebe or a 50 mm. tebe, the humongous 50 tebe back in the day, mm. and then be able to make a call. And I made a call to my mother and said to her, I came on let's go fishing because I knew her office line. And I was like, I need you to come and pick me up because I can't, what I'm going through for me is torture. I keep on being told to do these very heavy boys kind of chores, yeah. whereas what I want to do is much more your household kind of so chores. So that was, that that was around days. primary school. Yeah, I'm, I'm, primary. I'm, interest, I'm interested in knowing the transition because um, most of us, uh, primary school was, uh, uh, secondary school was a bit rough, yeah. even for us guys. Yeah. Senior school was worse. Yeah. For even us guys, we had to, you, you, you know what I mean? Fend for the self. Yeah, fend for ourselves. So I'm trying to understand as you are going through all of this and you transition from primary school to secondary school and, and junior school yeah. with all of these other kids in this community, how were you coping? Were yeah. you keeping stuff to yourself or were you being open and what was happening? I've always, I was born with the gift of gap. So oh, I've never had the opportunity to keep shit tell. to myself. <laughs> I say it as it is. Yes. Um, and I think my mother also then bore that in me a little bit because mm. she always had the statement, which yeah. meant to me that I kind of had to teach my own mother how to be able to mother me, which mm. is why then she ended up raising me as a girl because then she was like, okay, fine. It's what she wants, I'm gonna give it to her. Yes. So likewise in, in school environment, I think that's why then I became in a debater competitively from Unit Standard 5 itself. That's where I think this whole voice and mm. agency was born in me to be able to just say, I'm gonna speak for myself because nobody seems to get it. So I always was in trouble for just the most ridiculous of things, Lawrence. Yeah. I was a NASA student who was always beaten for the fact that I wrote the wrong pronouns about the self when I was writing compositions. What or, wrong pronoun? What do you mean you wrote the wrong pronoun? Apparently it, it was wrong where yeah. I would speak about myself as a girl as instead a girl of as, as a boy. Oh. So that was only something that I got in trouble with. So you're not dressing up as a girl? You're... I was dressed up like a boy. So they forced me into, which I was comfortable because I grew up in the middle of three brothers. So yeah. I was kind of a tomboy growing up. So yeah, 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 it, yeah. it wasn't much of... Yeah, of we grew up around but, the, those, but, then yeah. the, but then there was a denialism from mm. having to be able to wear a dress when I wanted to. So mm. that, there was just no allowance created for that. And then that's why then I always was in conflict with teachers about the fact that I just was denied a lot of things that other girls had and I didn't understand why, even though they kept on trying to emphasize this thing of a bodily structure that I was born into, mm -hmm. it still did not make sense to my brain. Hence, I think it's why there was also this, I guess, dislike, which mm -hmm. we call a dysphoria for mm -hmm. my body, particularly a particular organ that was on it that I was told I'm supposed to identify with it and I didn't.
Okay. So, we'll go back to yeah. that. I, I want us, before we go back to that uh, in deep, uh, I want us to, to, to move through something quick. Um, in, in your activism, clearly, um, it, it comes from the background where you are from. Yeah. You had to really stand up against um, quite a lot of uh, pressure and all the yeah. lies. The first time I heard about you and I saw you was uh, the case uh, uh, against government. Oh, yes. On your gender marker. Your gender, e exactly. Uh, which you won, yeah. which was uh, a monumental uh, win in the history of 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 of, uh, of Botswana government and yeah. LGBTQI um, right. uh, community. Yep. Exactly. When did you know, or when did the idea come to you that I'm going to change my mind and I'm taking government to court? Yeah. What? 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 Yeah. That... What happened? <laughs> It's funny because it, it mm. was never necessarily something that I came into with an intent for mm. because it happened by, by default in that when I got back, because I was studying in Joburg, Komanash, mm. and then I worked for another year thereafter, after graduation. So that was when you were still using yes, your my, he Oma. At the male Omang at the yes, time. Yes, yes. So I then am relocating from Joburg to Botswana mm. and I lose a docket that had some of my certificates and my ID card. I didn't like to carry it around more so that I didn't need it when I'm in SA. I use okay. a passport for identification. So I, I just didn't use it per se for the time that I was that side. And then upon wanting to just get it replaced because of mm. the fact that I was now beginning to put myself out there in the country looking for jobs, and I needed to always have to attach a copy of the ID, which I didn't have. Mm. So I approached the officer Omang, just so naive and just gullible, believing that it was just going to be a simple process. And I'm yeah. told, hold up, because I've always, yeah, been pretty. I've always been, yeah, designed in a very feminine kind of way. Yeah. So I stood in front of this person, and mind you, this is like, almost four years already having been on estrogen therapy, hormonal therapy. Mm. So these are there. This is how I look. Yeah. And the lady who was at the desk at the time said to me, did you realize that there's... And then she said, did you realize like there's an error? That must have been phenomenal. And what was your reaction? She, it was like, oh, here goes. Um, I wasn't looking forward to the interaction, but I was just like, okay, fine. I'm just going to lay it, lay it out as it is. So she was like, did you know these? And I'm like, yeah, I know. One day we'll get it corrected. She's like, but unfortunately, I can't replace this Omang Unsejan. Mm. What's the story? So I now have to tell her I'm trans-identified. I've gone through this medical transition. And yeah, I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. But the ID was conferred that way at the time when I applied for Oman based on my birth records. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, your case is very complex. I can't. I would be aiding you to carry a fraudulent identity document. So you need to see our registrar for the Khabaruni region. Can you come this side? And then she directed me to the officer. I think it was Mr. Disang at the time. Mm. And then that's how then this whole entire process then unfolded. Still very much naive to how this is going to be like years of a battle. I get in, I do the same thing, give the narrative. And then the registrar is like, you can't do this without a court order. But we also cannot give you this ID as it is because it would be as aiding you to carry a fraudulent which the, documentation, yes. which means we are aiding you to become a criminal. But I want you to continue with that. Yeah. Before you go that, there's something is running on my mind. Um, the question I asked earlier on, uh, at home, yeah. uh, mom's mo mother already understand yeah. um, where, where, where to identify with. Yeah, in the and that was before you had an umang. Yes. Why is it that then she herself understanding that allowed you to have a umang that I was identified with? Because at, what, the, what yeah, at the time, here's the thing, Lawrence, mm. you can imagine we grew up at a time where, like you were asking me how schooling was. I remember mm. in junior high debating emotion where national junior at schools competitions mm. around the legalization of homosexuality. Oh, really? And yes, I was in Form 2 at the time what? that we were debating that motion for nationals. Yeah. I was at Masala at the time and I was the only Form 2 student who was in the national team. Oh, yeah. 
And then doing a lot of research around that, all that came up was often around lesbians and gays, nothing on trans. Mm. So at the time that I was conferred an ID, I think I was in Form 3 at 16 years of age at that time. Mm. There was just no knowledge about and what I was. It was still this question to, mark. Yeah. If, even the people so, around you yeah, had not because had, it's, it's the a thing. It's a different it. thing at the time for an apportionate way yep. where, where specifically it should be categorized and how it should be dealt with. Nobody knew life. what I was. So it, before you yeah. do zoom, you have an omang. I already have an omang because I'm told you. you must have an omang at 16. So while yes. we are still trying to grapple with this concept of. Because even at the time, my mother was running around speaking to some, because she is a senior by law technician for the Khabarone City Council. So she's worked for different departments over the years. Mm. And she has social worker friends by Nukurai, a part of, of that department. And she did a lot of investigation to just try and find out what is my child? Because then if it's not a boy, but then apparently it's not girl enough either, where does it fall? And she keeps on saying she's a girl and not a boy. At Her least, being yeah. a traditionalist. Yeah, to she was just a conservative, and and, yeah. a traditional mm. woman. Yeah. And at least for me, young enough to really want to go and self-educate and mm -hmm. didn't just recline on to what she knew. Okay. She went and sought answers all through until I finished high school. My mother was still even knocking at the door, yeah. Princess Marina at the time, speaking yes. to doctors. So what happens? What yeah. happens now... Um, after the Umang office, yeah. uh, that you end up with the lawyers? I am now being told I am an undocumented Motswana, basically, who what? is an, of adult age but does not have an ID. Because without an ID, I don't have any other form of, of identification, particularly in the country where the passport only works when you exit the country. Okay. Tell, tell me, how was it working? Mm -hmm. Were they refusing to give you the male ID? Or were they willing to give you the male ID? and you're refusing it because you're saying that's not my ID. They were refusing to confer the mail Both. assignment. So I, I was left in limbo. So mm -hmm. I, I literally, and that's the, the struggle and plight of a lot of, especially trans and intersex people, yeah. where if we are not conferred the right gender markers and we are also denied use of those incorrect ones, what you, was you that end basis up in, of refusing, in let, 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 Let's start maybe from, what was that basis of refusing to give you the mail ID, let's say? The that, one that, that it was it had. would be fraudulent because then physiologically I presented as female, so and, then they, the, refused and they refused to confer the one that says female because then the law was unprecedented at the time where it did not exist and it did not provide for that kind of a gender marker change, except with a, a direction of the court. What was your lawyer's first reaction? We thought that we were just going to be busy citing the, firstly, the Births and Death Registration Act, and then the Civil and National Registration Act, which in it, I think it was section 15 of it, that then said if there's been any material shifts or changes, mm -hmm. then there ought to be presentation of evidence to that effect. So we just thought that it was going to be that simple provide affidavits from my family supporting and corroborating the fact that I was raised as a woman and then also then speak to this hormonal therapy that I had been on since like 2007 when I got into varsity and unbeknown to us it was going to be a whole need for a constitutional interpretation before yes. that kind of a gender marker as a court order yes. would be effected because then we needed to read those rights of transgender persons into the breadth of the constitution. Oh, okay. So we didn't even think we were going for a constitutional case. No, one, just, no we, one saw it coming. No, we just understood um, it was a simple, I would say, administrative or bureaucratic kind of process of just going to go and say, here's evidence, okay, perfect, court order, go and make the change. And be known to us it was going to be years mm. because then government on the one end over the years was willing to abide by the decision of the court Jiggy jiggy in the middle of, of all of that, they changed their stance again to that of opposition. Yes, we'll go, we'll, we'll yeah. go into that about, about so how government it, was we, transitioning. We were about, really unprepared. Tell me about um, the issue that you mentioned about material change. Yeah. Uh, at some point you were mentioning, um, was it enhancing? Estrogen enhancing? Is, is, estrogen, estrogen therapy, Estrogen enhancing yes. therapy and yeah. some material change. I, I want to understand that complex before we get into the ups and downs Absolutely. of how the government case went because that, that formed the basis also of your argument, I yeah. guess, to say, but um, this is, here I am. 
uh, what material changes and what does it mean? Yeah. Um, I'll allow you to be open or explicit as you want, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. I think we are going to have to be a bit explicit because okay. then some other things are really more biomedical and it, it makes sense to just be as explicit about them for somebody to really I guess fathom. we are seekers of knowledge That's in this exactly podcast. That's exactly it. Let's and if, we are, up, if let's, we're let's going to be shy it. around certain yes. aspects, we are not informing another person really. Yes. But ideally, the material changes come in the form of, for instance, that two other forms, these social transitioning, which is in terms of one's own social space that they occupy mm. within the homestead, in a workspace, in a church environment, in a school environment, and all mm. other social spaces we occupy. Mm. And then there's a medical transition. A medical transition is where there is medicines or medical kind of technology that's applied to one's body in order to bring it into congruence with how they identify internally. Yeah. And in that essence, for me specifically, it was in the form of being given estrogen therapy, which is ongoing. I mean, I inject estrogen much like any other woman or female has a monthly cycle. Mm. I also have a monthly cycle for my estrogen. Mm. Um, and in so doing, it meant that phenotypically, I began to conform to what a typical female would grow up to look like. My breasts, Biologically. Yes, yes, my breasts started growing. Mm. Um, facially, I started becoming more and more smoother. I became mm. more pale than a, a male would be, mm. ideally. Um, lesser of bodily hairs on me, because mm. then testosterone isn't it really enhances um, bodily hair growth. Yeah. So because of the absence of or the lowering of testosterone, it meant that then I had a lot of estrogen that then created this kind of very soft features of a female as well. Um, hips started growing, booty started growing. So there. yeah, in, in, in one of <laughs> in one of the articles that you wrote uh, that are, that I once published, you spoke about uh, gender realignment. Yes. Um. I've, I assume I made an assumption that yeah. I understand what what you are meaning. Maybe I have an opportunity now, now to, to really to, to really have you bring me to understanding between this estrogen and all of that. Yeah. And where we and before we we continue with the mm -hmm. case issue. Absolutely. What 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 was that? So the gender we call it gender affirmation mm. um, because then ideally it's a process through which one seeks to be able to bring congruence between the physical appearance mm. and that of how you see yourself on the inside. So mm. the gender affirmation aspects of it, like I was saying, there's the medical. The medical is ideally just around these hormonal therapy mm. that I was put on mm. that then created this female or fem feminine outlook of my body, the softening of my voice. Mm. Thank God I was a late bloomer, so I didn't necessarily have a breaking of a voice, mm. but I do have very deep notes of my voice, which I enjoy, mm. like uh, a lot of other women, Yonina, Simone and them, that have these kind of lower registers yeah, to their I voice. Yeah. So I was also then gifted with that, obviously. Um, but then there's also then the surgical affirmation aspect yes. of it, which in 2016, December, saw me having to travel to Thailand with my mom, my best friend and an aunt of mine who all accompanied me to Thailand to go mm. and do this surgery. Mm. And the surgery ideally is what then changed and transformed my sexual construct okay. in order for me to be fully female bodied now yeah. at the point. Because then with the medical, it was still more of the physiological yeah. um, and phenotypical kind of appearance. Mm. Then the surgical went a further step of having to now I call her Her Majesty. Um, I will have to be. <laughs> uh. The girl we went to go get, get in Thailand. I mean, really. Okay. Um, I call her Her Majesty. So when we went to yeah, go get Her yeah, Majesty. You... So Her Majesty is, uh. is yeah, a, 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 an organ on my uh. body that of course. I wasn't that, born with. So, yes. get... so I had okay. to get Her Majesty okay. because we went to the kingdom of the Thai. So yeah. that's why then. I think when we were looking for a name for her, I think a lot of women have a name for that 
Others call them Enana, others my little girl, others my flower. Mm. Mine is Her Majesty. Mm -hmm. I think males and men often that also have names for... That was before you got married. That yeah. was before you got married yeah, or during I, or after. I was that engaged was at the point. You were engaged so at the, my at husband the time. had proposed to me a year before yes. I went for surgery. We didn't even know when the surgery was going to happen, but the guy was already sure about the fact that he wanted to marry me. Yeah. So 2016, it happens right at the time in where it had been like a year that we were engaged because mm. we got engaged in October of 2015 and then December of 2016 was when I had Her Majesty. So in that time, it was already he was my fiancé, I was his fiancé. So in so doing, it's how then I have a female body. Really, yeah. the only surgery I had relating to my gender was that, getting Her Majesty. I didn't have facial feminization yeah. surgery. I've not had any Adam's apple shaving mm. I've not had anything else done, added onto my body, no augmentation of breast, nothing. Mm. So that's the only thing that I did. And ideally, that's then how I often say to somebody, I'm now female bodied yeah. um, because of the fact that then when you look at the physique of a female. Yes. In most, I, in most of uh, some of your writings that I read, you've been talking about uh, being gender assigned. <laughs> and uh, I think there was one uh, hilarious uh, story that you wrote about that... Uh, uh, like us when we see a woman, yeah, that's how we feel. And uh, similarly to you, when yeah. you see a man, that's how you feel yes. because to you and uh, also your husband, you did say that when she sees you, she doesn't see a transgender. She sees this woman of mine. He just sees a um, woman. Can you just uh, break it down a little bit? How how, how you come across? Uh, these conclusions and feelings and understandings. I mean, it's it's, it's been interesting. Since we no. are talking about yes. him and your transition. I yes. mean, he's just one, but many of the experiences and encounters I had with, with males and with men, particularly heterosexual men, yes. which over the years, way before even my medical or surgical transition happened, I've just always been one of those women that had more of what we would call an athletic build mm. to her body. So a bit slender, tall, pretty. Um, and then given that, it's how then I've often attracted straight men, ideally, yes. whom when they looked oh. at me, they never even knew I was trans. Yes. Oh, let me read you a paragraph yes. that you wrote what to put write? you in perspective. <laughs> you said, this discovery about my sexual attractions preferences and relationships began to ask me questions about what this sexual orientation of mine was called. Yes. I could not say I was heterosexual, given that heterosexuality often refers to relationships with two or more people of the opposite sex and yes. gender. I could not say I was gay just because I had been with some while I identified as a woman. Yeah. I could not definitely say I was lesbian, though I found other women attractive and queer, I being Trans also meant that I came with a mixed masala of a body, an identity that yep. transgressed <laughs> definitions of women and females into the relationships <laughs> I went to. What was my sexual orientation then, if not any of those listed? Yep. That was your question oh, in wow. your writing. Did you, did you find the answer? I, I have. I now do have the okay. answer. Yes. It's, it's taken experiences with different bodies of people and identities to get to that place. Much as I, I'm in a marriage with a heterosexual man, mm. I personally don't identify as heterosexual yeah. because I'm attracted, what I've understood is that I'm attracted to masculinity. And masculinity comes in a lot of different bodies. It comes in straight men's bodies. It comes in bisexual men's bodies. It comes in lesbian women who are butch um, bodies. It comes in transgender men's bodies. Mm. So I, I definitely realized over the years with being with different bodies that the thing that really attracted me to another person was just an opposite gender expression. Uh -huh. However they identified was that business, it had nothing to do with me. But then it made it difficult because then sexual orientation itself has often been defined by one's own either sex assignment or gender they occupy. What you, what you just said, I find it very intriguing because I think I swear to God I've heard it before. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, a lot of men don't care that 
whether a woman is a lesbian or, or not. not. Uh, it, it's, it's often a thing of, just, it's, it's a woman. It's a woman. Yes. And they maybe don't feel for, threatened. Nope. It's a woman. It's just a woman. Whether what she identifies with herself, they don't care. They don't care. And that's the thing I learned about being it's a... It's the same a, thing. It, 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 it's the same phenomenon. I mean, if I pull a thread from that, it's in that the most of men who I've been with, if I can put it in the blunt of sense, Mm. The most of men that I've been with who are heterosexual mm. had never had an experience with a transgender girl before. And the bulk of them, if not all of them, have remained still attracted to other women. There's never been a shift because of being with me. All of a sudden, the orientation mm. shifts. There, there has been a shift. In what you sense? You once told a story about... Yes. About um, a person who cried after having been with you. Yes. Can, because can he he, he now was hit with this thing of, and I was pre-op, pre-op meaning pre-surgery. Before surgery. Yes. yes. I was pre-op at the time. And he struggled with this thing of, I have liked what I was attracted to, yeah. to the point where we consummated this attraction. Yeah. But now what does it make me? Because then having been pre-op, I can put it bluntly, it, it meant there were certain things that weren't on my body, isn't it? So penetrative sex meant what? Anal penetrative sex. Yeah. Which ideally in the greater scheme of normative people, they yeah. believe that anal sex is somehow segregated to just gay people. Yes. But men and women can have anal penetration. Like it's not a thing for gay people only. So but he then he, he, he literally cried. He sat there and sobbed next to me and then I had to come him <laughs> down. And it was the first experience that I had, which was a shocker, of having to realize the psychosocial responsibility that I carry because then I kind of was always the boundary breaker yeah. for any man I've been with. They have to now confront this attraction they have for me yeah. and place it against the greater scheme of what that attraction is defined as. Yeah. Because ideally to them, being a straight man means that I'm a guy, guy's guy, and I can only be with this girl. Well, and then a girl you, like me. Confused. And then it's like, but she's still a girl. She's still pretty. Let's and, go for and a And I even break. enjoyed <laughs> sex with her. Then yeah. what? Exactly. What does that mean? Yeah. It breaks somebody's self-concept. Oh, yeah. And then you have to help them walk the journey of being able to reconcile mm -hmm. with the fact that I happen to now be what is breaking the definition for them of what their attraction to women looks like. But then still remaining the fact that they're attracted to women. Damn. Yep. That's quite beautiful. It's a, it's a lot. We are going to hold it there. Um, as, 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 as we were talking about uh, the, the kind of relationships we've been through, all, in, in all differences, I recall Kebala, one of the articles. You know, I used to have an editor called Douglas, Douglas Tiako. used to love mm -hmm. uh, working around your articles. And you'll come and pick in, in my really? newsroom and say, hey, comrade. Did you yeah. see what she just said? <laughs> this, this woman is faster than the devil, yo. Uh, he's a traditionalistic old, old man. Yeah. So um, I always had to try and work around. But he's a no, no, knowledgeable person mm -hmm. who really understands freedom of expression. Yeah. And you'll be like, yo, I'm learning. Then I say, I'm learning too. And... Uh, in that, uh, that's why maybe maybe we are here because I'm trying to advance my learning in this. Mm. But let me track back a minute. I want to understand uh, what in your experience and research, how you would describe Bagger, the social attitudes and cultural beliefs on the well-being and acceptance of the LGBTQ indi individuals, mm -hmm. specifically regarding <laughs> sexual orientation and gender equality. I, th I think it's, it's nuanced in that there is a belief that Botswana are conservative towards sexual and gender minorities. And when you do a bit of digging on the history of Botswana, you get to realize that not really. It, a lot of pre-colonial evidence points to the fact that Botswana have always embraced diversity. When you even look at what we were discussing earlier around the existence of language to denote 
transgender and intersex people's existence. Yeah. It's, on, it's not a phenomenon of knowing a Paul Morama or a Casta Semenya that we get to know intersex people. The very word, though borrowed in Setswana Latrasi, mm. denotes a people who have had encounters. And it has always been it's there. It's always though, been yeah. there, mm. Lord. When you try, to the point where my late great-great-grandmother actually knew it. Mama Nganata, we knew the fact that I was going to And this is a word that was even thrown at me at some point when I was mm. still growing up as we were trying to figure out what mm. I am. So the attitudes and the acceptance. The, it's it's, it's, always, it's mm. always been there. And I think we need to be honest. Even I, as a Christian, need to be honest about the fact that there's a lot of damage that Christianity and its prescriptivity around this binarisms around gender mm. and creating these purist kind of ca categorizations really hampered a lot or done a lot of damage in terms of invisibilizing and erasing mm. the kind of knowledge pockets of knowledge and traditional knowledge that actually existed mm. around different lgbti people and I can, I can give you even an example of a typical example around Uganda right now that just passed in the most atrocious law against LGBTI people. But pre-colonial Uganda had, which was the Buganda Kingdom, mm. they had a King Mwanga II law who was mm. attracted to other men. Up until the Portuguese invaders came through mm. and then there was this aberration for mm. his kind of sexual orientation, that's when now it started to then be entrenched into the social fabric of mm. the Ugandans such that now jiggy jiggy to 2023, that same exact country that had a king mm. who was homosexual mm. now claims that but it is an, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an, yeah. an, an African. Yeah. But then bring it back to even our own mm. San community in Botswana. There is a an, an, an general called the African Sexu Gen General of African Sexualities that is able to narrate to us the fact mm. that we do have on rock paintings of, of the Sen community the notions mm. of men as they engage sexually with each other when they were away for weeks and months mm. from their own spouses and other um, opposite gendered sexual partners as a way where it, there was no kind of sexual se social reprisals mm. around the fact that two men could be able to satisfy each other in the absence of their preferred females. But there was nothing about it that then warranted this kind of outcry and the kind of... So he bred an issue of non-acceptance. Of non-acceptance. And it comes with a white man because then mm. before a white master came onto this land and with their violent tactics mm. of using education and of using religion yes. as tools to control yes. and to for, for social control, ideally, yes. we were a people that were able to embrace diversity. Yes. Which is, but yeah. with understanding that hatred, you Sorry, with understanding that history, uh, fast forward, I, wa I, I want to get the context in the current. In the now, in the exactly. current because Botswana has made significant steps, mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, from, from a policy level, from Absolutely. a government level, at least to try and accommodate. I know it has been a fight and, and, and yeah. a long up, uphill battle, but at least right now, uh, what, what is the current position in terms of attitudes and yeah. acceptance? In the Botswana context. Absolutely. I mean, the latest stats from the Afrobarometer that often measures um, mm. different societal appreciation or um, aberration of LGBTI persons continuously showing us that there's a growing cohort and percentage mm. of Botswana that have begun to really, we move from like a 37% before the decriminalization mm. to like a 43% at this point mm. in time and growing because of the fact that there has been, there's now become more and more, I guess, representation of mm. queerness, of LGBTI portrayals. In music, you now have people like Motafere who are mm. out there, You additionally to people like um, Shanti Lo, for instance. Mm. You have now people like ATI who are also just out there and just living life on, on the large side. Mm. And that already denotes to you a certain level of a social structure that is accepting of diversity and the representations that come with it, including the creative outlets for it. Additionally to the fact that I think our own court systems yes. are showing us that even the, the, the academic of today, even the legal mind of today, mm. is one that appreciates the particular vulnerabilities and needs of LGBTI people. So there's a significant shift. 
but the current then, position yeah. in in your dialogues where are we yeah. i know we've been through uh tell me first let's start it this way Mo, former president mohaya used to to refused yeah during his tenure and then after he admitted that look i didn't want to lose, lose votes in yeah. elections but so now we're not ready for this and then uh came in kama and then came in Masisi. Masisi. What is the current status quo with government in, in terms of acceptance from a higher level? I mean, we, as you say, and rightfully, Lo, it's good to be able to point to the leadership because I think oftentimes that's what then denotes the shifts or the conservative nature that any particular community might be. The times of um, President Dr. Festus Mokhaye, we... Ideally, we're still very conservative around the, the idea of just the freedoms for LGBTI mm. people or even this concept of homosexuality, which is often where the conversation gets stuck around the, mm. the sexual expressions of LGBTI or people. Or sometimes, yes. Or even begins, yes. Yeah. There does happen those instances. But we now connect that back to a 2018 statement that Mokhizi um, Masisi made at a time mm. where in 2018 December as the country and the rest of the world was commemorating and honoring mm. um, the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And he made a very profound statement for a sitting president, mm. one acknowledging the very particular vulnerabilities of LGBTI mm. people. Yeah, which he did, yeah. And ideally also acknowledging that there's a lot of violence based on sexual orientation or gender expression of LGBTI people that many at times sees the community living in fear of having to report some of these violent experiences mm. Mm. where there would be no remedy, but mm. that there is a need for a country to acknowledge the gender basis of the violence that is instigated towards LGBTI persons mm. and beginning to force a government to also acknowledge that there needs to be recourse or an mm. intervention to ensuring that those forms of violence towards LGBTI people were remedied. It tells us of a country that is shifting because yeah. then it means the same fear that a Festus Mohai feared in his tenure it no longer exists such that MRCC did not lose fear losing votes or popularity Incredible. based on such a bold stance to have to acknowledge that LGBTI people also actually mm. are victims and mm. subject to sexual and gender-based violence and femicide in and of itself. So how, how, how then in, in that case do you navigate discussions with individuals or groups who hold opposing views? Yeah. At the end of the day, I want to know whether you've encountered criticism from within the LGBTQI community mm -hmm. regarding your activism and, and, and methods and how do you respond to such feedback and critique and people holding opposing views? I, I think definitely I am well aware of the fact that I am not everybody's cup of tea personally as an individual yeah. but then two <clears throat> that the, the very embodiment of queer diversity in and of itself is not everybody's cup of tea. But the one thing that I have learned over the years is just the power of personal narratives. I think that's what also even brings us to this conversation here mm. on how just many people often carry certain opposing views based on what they have seen as a portrayal on TV or just on any kind of media output. But not having ever had an encounter with a person who happens to be queer or LGBTI in one way or the other, mm -hmm. to be able to break down these Chinese walls that often exist where we tend to think that certain concepts and certain existence of people is a foreign concept. So I've often used my own personal narrative and experience to be able to just break down this mystique that often surrounds, I think, this discussion around our queerness. And that's when we often break down, at least some people, not all, I think mm. there are some people who really are staunch and they, they carry their belief system to the, to the grave. But many people shift where their heart starts connecting to the mind. Mm. The mind knows about LGBTI people and it might carry whatever opposing views. And then comes this point of having to sit down with a person who happens to be LGBTI and listening so out to the... So you deal with them the, by sitting down with and, them? And, and using my personal narrative. It might yes. not be even be sitting as we're sitting, yeah. but utilizing even such kind of platforms to be able mm. to just then give a face and a personhood mm. to our existence. Because it's often well, and we saw this even in the Botswana context around the HIV um, pandemic at the mm. time when it was ravaging our country Old in the 90s. The stigma yeah. was born out of the belief that 
there were certain people who were HIV prone, and then mm. there was the rest of us whom we were living good, and as such, it would never knock on our doors. Yeah. Up until it started knocking on each and every family's door, yeah. did we realize the universality mm. of the human plight that was then inflicted by this very virus? Yes. So it's the same thing that I have <clears throat> used my own personal narrative mm. to be able to shift people's attitudes where we often think that it's a, it's a Western phenomenon, yes and that a, ch a person who is LGBTI might not be Christian, might not come from a good family, might not be smart, might not be um, entrepreneurial, that they might not Which be creative. Which are dogmas and traits of any living of human any being anyway. Being. But tell me, Jordan Patterson, yeah. Professor Jordan Patterson, Patterson um, says quite a lot about, and he's very open about his position, more especially on feminism yeah. and transgenders and whatnot. Uh, I know we've talked about what is your position about his views? I mean, he's given too much airplay, if you ask me. But then uh, we have to understand we live in a time where the anti-gender movement and agenda really has been highly resourced and has been given so much of airtime. Mm. Um, I do think he carries very hazardous and very harmful and regressive kind of mindset because then it, it has a way of invisibilizing, erasing, and demeaning the experiences of those that find themselves on the margins of society. When mm. you are able to, for instance, the stance that he takes where he believes that um, LGBTI people are just fueled by a victimhood mentality, it, 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 it somehow for me is, it, it lacks cognizance of the levels of violence, of ostracization, of exclusion that LGBTI people, and any, is, mind, any person who is, is a minority. Language, is it in the language or in the wit of which he picks up the debate? I think in both, um, mm. because then there has been utterances that um, he's made in, in some other lecture that he, he did. Um, I'm not too sure exactly when, but where he was speaking about LGBTI people as just really victim-centric and victim-oriented. Speaking about victim-centric. And, and, just want, and wanting to just foreground uh, themselves yeah. for somebody to carry pity on them, that why not just carry on like any other person in yeah. greater society? You've uh, watched yeah. um, my, my favorite comedian, um, Dave Chappelle. I, I know Dave You've Chappelle. You've seen the, yeah, the, the, the stand-up comedy his, where he spoke his about his transgender sport. friend. Yeah. And he's been making a lot of uh, comedy around transgender people. And uh, he said his friend was deaf me. Uh, and uh, to him as Dave, uh, he was trying to normalize, like everybody else, mm -hmm. making jokes about black people, about mm -hmm. broke people, mm -hmm. about poor people, about people with no jobs, about white people, about politicians, about transgenders, about whoever in the society. But then he said that he found um, a, a serious problem about when he's making jokes about transgender people, then he runs into problems. Yeah. And he's saying, but, uh, and then his friend definitely said, make jokes about us because we are part of the society yeah. as well. And then he ends his story by saying that um, uh, Daphne was attacked for defending him as Dave Chappelle. Yeah. And uh, you, you, saw, you, saw, you saw that episode? I remember a clip of it, but I, I didn't necessarily follow too much into it. Well, I, But I, I remember even reading up on some other reflections from my own community about it as well. Yes. I don't think maybe Dave Chappell appeals as a favorite uh, in that sect, but he was trying to make a point, maybe from my understanding, yeah. I could be wrong, yeah. but to my understanding that... Look, um, we normalize having jokes around everybody, everybody in, including the small kid in the house. Yeah. Um, why should I treat you special? And different. We should make a joke even, about everybody else. Yeah. That was him. Yeah. But I don't know where that sits with you yeah. and, and whatnot. It's, it's nuanced, though, mm. because then personally, I just have a problem with irresponsible comedy. Mm. And when I say irresponsible comedy, I'm, I'm talking about where we poke fun at 
certain communities where we are reinforcing certain kind of stereotypes that might be harmful. Mm. Um, because I, I have seen comedy that's clean, that does not necessarily derogate or insult, mm. but then there's often persons that wish to go the extra mile of having to have a condonation mm. for when they are driving really harmful kind of perspectives and, and perceptions around certain particular subsect of community. Mm. Um, but then it's 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 all and well to put it that way while at the same time like you're saying we have to walk the the fine line of that everybody else in greater community is often one of, poked guess, make fun fun of and all the for lives. one I've thing seen. or another about them yes. that might be stereotypical but I, I do think that for me it's just always a caution to just continue to be sensitive. Kalangas yeah. get made fun of. Yeah. Basara get made fun of. And then Molepolule gets made fun of. So sometimes I'm trying we, to We need figure to figure out, out how do we do context, com comedy it, mm. in such a way that we do it responsibly. Mm. I cannot say, necessarily say to because I, I am not the most humorous of, of human beings. Okay. But I do think that there is a responsible way of being able to do comedy that does not necessarily Necessarily at times, mm. even further the inflictions that are felt by certain communities. I mean, mm. it's why we are still polarized about what happened um, at the Academy Awards between Chris Rock and Will Smith. Will Smith, yeah. Because another person on the one end is just like, Will didn't have to respond in that way. But at the same time, you imagine somebody poking fun at your wife who is dealing with a particular slept, afflic slept affliction. It, it, it does not yeah. sit well when you are on the receiving yeah. end or you're a part of a community that understands the plight of that community that another person gets to just make fun of and make money out of, making yeah. fun of. of Whereas the lived reality is nothing yes. fun, really. Speaking of Will and Jada, uh, is it easy being married as a, as a trans person? Um... Who? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Tell me about uh, it. You were married I, in what, 2007, I, right? 2017. 2017. Um, and then, yes. yeah, and now going through a divorce, if yeah. I may just put it out there. Um, what? Yeah. So it's, 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 it's not easy. And part of the reason why the marriage has reached um, this place where I'm making the decision for me to end the marriage, yes. it's out of the fact that I, I feel like, going back to the question we had earlier of my experiences with different men, more especially yeah. with heterosexual men, mm. there is a certain particular expectation that because I am female and I'm a woman and I will just occupy this womanly role and there is no kind of cognizance of the fact that my transness in and of itself is an ongoing journey of self-discovery. Wait, 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 wait. You are confusing me. Yes. You are my wife. Yes. Let's say. You yes. are my wife. Yes. So that's it. What else, the, Jenny, are you talking about? So here's the thing. Married yeah. to a woman like myself who is mm. a trans rights activist, mm. you, you cannot just marry me and believe that my transness becomes something that's just out there. It, trans it, meaning you are in transition or... Trans meaning that my journey of my gender mm. began on the opposite end of a spectrum okay. that I was born on. Mm. And as such, transitioning does not end because I got Her Majesty or that I'm on hormonal therapy. Even just self-discovery around my own sexuality, my preferences. You are in a continuum. I'm in a continuum. I think every single person is forever transitioning. Be before we go there, yeah. I, I would like us to bring two things to the fore, which now uh, I'm curious to understand. Yeah. Uh, you went to Thailand yeah. to get your, you said queen? Her Majesty. Her Majesty. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy. I know how guy functions, right? Yeah. Um, is the Queen Majesty. Yes. Right. Um, in that in itself, for me, if I've accepted that's what it is, which I, I, I would like to believe uh, your husband is saying, yeah, this is my Queen Majesty, this, this, this is what I define wife. with, and that's it. This is um, yeah, her body and how we get to and be. And how we get to be. So at what point then are you? Is there a shift or a change? Shift and confusion. <laughs> Here's the thing, Lord. Because he knows I, when he wants to. Yes, he gets what he this wants. is what he will get. Yes. And then here is the caveat um, mm. of a woman like myself whom her own sexuality began on one end mm. and then it's gone through this 
I would say a metamorphosis mm -hmm. that it doesn't end. The things that I want to explore with my body and with other bodies have all continuously been on an evolution. Sounds like and... you have more body bags. <laughs> Like you so have more in, in terms there. of yeah. what I, I get to do with, with my partner mm. and not wanting to be limited to what is expected as normative roles, let me put it in a blunt sense low here. Mm. There is often this expectation, which is really problematic, mm. of that who is a pitcher and who is a catcher. Have you heard that being used in... in LGBTI yeah, yeah, yeah. spaces, denoting that the feminine one will be the, the one who catches, and, yes. uh, read from and then the articles, one, yes, yes, one who penetrates, and then the one who gets yes. penetrated. Mm. But then, when you are a woman like myself, and many of people in my community who are continuously just getting to know themselves, and at times you want to explore things such as pegging, what's that? The penetration of a man by a woman, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You would need to go and do a bit of what? research on this. <laughs> if you've seen, it's a phenomenon that heterosexual yeah. couples um, are exploring with in today's times. And yeah. that's where you bring in sex toys and you can bring in dildos, you can bring in strap-ons. But and most, then it men, allows most, you most to men reverse. are macho. Most men are macho in the majority. Yep. In the majority. But then there are those that mm. actually are explorative yes. as well, who are not so conservative about exploring even their own yeah. sexuality outside of what they were told mm -hmm. this is how a woman and a man get to be so what are you divorcing for what what's the um it's it's been a lot of things i think our marriage was inequitable um first and foremost and it goes towards the ways in which him and i in terms of how we've built our own businesses our own brands and careers you, you, you did say to me that he's not gay no he's, he's not straight. very much so and um, when you say not equitable, let me give you an example. Let me give yeah, you an example. It's more economically equitable. Um, no, so let's, let's, the finances leave, of, let's leave the economy. Yes, they the don't finance. matter. That's not what we are talking about. Yeah. Um, for example, I am my wife, or oh, I, when I'm with a woman, mm. I know that she's either submissive or knows that or she's receptive. a woman or receptive and whatnot. Forget the, the point that uh, my wife will kick my ass, she's stubborn and whatnot, yeah. to look like I and whatnot. Yes. But she knows that I'm the man, it, I'm the guy. Comes, yes. When it comes to whatever and when I put my foot down and whatever. So I'm trying to understand your point in position to say you were not equitable and you are in a transition. Yes. And that's what? why I said to you when I answered the, gave yeah. you the first response, it was that it's a myriad of interconnected issues that have led to, I think, this, what I feel is irreconcilable differences in the marriage. Mm -hmm. That's one of them, and it can be a long as conversation about the lack of equity in the marriage. That's one. And then two, mm. a, a feel on my part that I was in an, a structure of a marriage that was stifling for me, that I could not continue to explore myself. And I'm a woman whose journey began with her having to be vocal for herself to say, this is me, this is what I want, this is how I want to be with other human beings. Mm. But then when you are in a marriage setup where you are being told you will not get to do certain things, yeah, it, 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 it can typically get, African men can, come from that yeah, traditionalistic which point will of be view. Stifling for a woman um, but, like me but, who's but, a trans feminist. Yeah, but I, we, I fought for my freedoms as the government of Botswana and mm. I won. But even for me, I'm not even looking at it from that standpoint. Yeah. I'm looking at it from a standpoint that we are a woman, uh, and typically men, African yeah. men. Or most men in general. Say African men, thank you. That is the correct. Uh, but also, most, most men in general yeah. are, are, are machoistic. Uh, we want to be felt in our presence. Yeah, to in the be house. the one to yes, chase and, whatnot. and to pursue. So you seem to be quite in revolt with that. I am, highly. Oh. I, I, I cannot. No, much as I went through this transition to mm. becoming a woman, and that's how I see myself, I did not transition into a normative and conservative definition of a woman. So I married where there was a contract that I mm. negotiated with, with my husband. And it also then included such kind of different gender roles in the household that at the very onset I was told we are okay with. 
And then along the progression of the nine and a half years that we we were together, those shifted, and they shifted because there was this external pressure from his own his Congolese, so West African kind was of dictate. Was it really a shift? It was because or, then or, what we or agreed. Or people were suddenly becoming who they are. Well, it is still a shift because then what somebody has entered into as a premise of mm. what our structure of marriage was going to look like, and then they recline into who they are, it mm. shifts that which we were already okay. ag in agreement and consensus mm. about. And for me, that I struggled with, that now there was an expectation that I'm going to fall into some normative role and then somehow stop growing, stop exploring, stop wanting to know myself, stop trying mm. new things about myself and trying new things but about it, my it, body. It, it reminds me of an analogy that uh, you keep a leopard in your house as a pet when it grows. What do you think it's going to do? What it do will you think it's going to do? So you That's get an African macho man. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where you're going with that? At the end of the day, he's going to end up being an African but macho man. But here's the man. thing. I, 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 think, saying, I, I know, think I've been naive yeah. in, the, in the way in which I have there's, there's, crafted yeah. my, my relationships. Mm. Because they've always been negotiated from get-go. So get is that call. the transition you're talking I'm about? Talking trying about to experience? Because then mm. I continue to grow into myself. I continue to ask myself questions. Mm. Much like I can sit and say to somebody, I will not, for instance, take an interview with my husband where we're talking about us being heterosexual. I'm not heterosexual. But if it offends the other person because then the heterosexuality is also defined by you being heterosexual, mm -hmm. then we are not going to win because ideally the one party is always going to be frustrated mm -hmm. by the fact that my wife never settled into a typical con traditional kind of wife kind but of behavior. But you're speaking about contracts and agreement. Yes. But you say that he considered and agreed on something. Yes. When or what did you agree with? I agreed to continue growing with the person. I agreed to continue being my full, some, full wholesome self. Okay. And then when I feel that there are reprisals to you continuously and limitations. Mm. I mean, like we were, how we started this conversation. Mm. My mother, in the most fortunate of ways, gave me this belief that my mm. world is my own to be able to define by my own rules. Mm. And then I thought that I entered into an institution with somebody who said to me, we are not necessarily going to be typical, so we need to design this thing for ourselves. Um, it includes things such as founding a family for ourselves that we knew was never going to be normative, because for ours, our journey involved surrogacy. So there was a whole non-normativity about it. And additionally to that, Sarugis meaning, that meaning somebody case. else was going to be caring for us. No, the marriage is ending okay. without children at this okay. point. But we were already embarked on that very process itself mm. where some people were involved in us becoming parents and having children. But then I have this thing, Lowe, because I know how gender can be incorrectly conferred on a child, mm. I, I'm staunch and I'm unwavering about the fact that I will not gender my children unless and when they start gendering themselves. And to another conservative person who agreed to that, mm. now at a later stage telling me that it's unacceptable, we refuse, it will not come to pass, mm. then it means I must keep on working and go and check for other people out there who might just be able to do that with me. Because I refuse to have children just because they have a penis, you're going to call them your boys and you're expecting they're going to play football. No, not under my watch. Because then for me, politically, because personally, you've been through I've been through that where yeah. it was a violent assignment mm. of which my kind of environment of raising children, for instance, quite different to how he would want to raise children. So it was these kind of differences that for me were already clear that we had a battle ahead of us that was never going to be reconciled. Somebody would have to yield to the other. So mm. it just looked like we were incompatible if you look at it. And do, I think, do, you, not, do you not think that the, the, the problem is not even the existential problem on the table yeah. is merely that uh, we are different. Yeah. And, and at, at, at some point, our differences will end up being illuminated yeah. more than the honeymoon. True. And then, and then when differences get illuminated more than the honeymoon, because we have less education, we have less experiences and whatnot, we tend to recline back to what, what we, we know, understand or what yeah. we know more. And then we end end up at the beginning of the cycle again. Yeah, that, that's very true. And but what kind of conversations are you having uh, with 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 your? I don't know whether he's ex now with your husband. Soon to just, be ex husband. Yes, yes, just because uh, now I loved what I've always seen, yeah, and I think I, I respected Kanza 
the Congolese used to call him in His some of my Tony. writings he used to say he was a block of chocolate. <laughs> Then like, oh, no, that that kind of bad. I I mean, mean, <laughs> this, that's too much information, Ricky. But, a tall, dark glass of yeah, chocolate. That's what they that. used to call him. And and I'm saying, ultimately, at the end of the day, now when I, where I see it, you see me, I'm still trying to, to understand and learn a lot. Yeah. He's been in there and walked the path. Yeah, he did. I can imagine when you guys are parting out, what kind of conversations are you having such that uh, you are both able to move further. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. I think it's harder for him mm -hmm. than it is for me because in, in his experience, he's yeah. really had to make a lot of sacrifice. I've made a lot of sacrifices, but I'm just speaking on just the kind of conversations we've had, that there's been a lot of sacrifices that he's had to make, a lot of losses that were encountered on his part, loss of family, loss mm -hmm. of friends, by just virtue of his choice to be with me. Mm. Um, and in so doing, there's just this now, was that all in vain? Mm. The kind of lost um, kind of feeling when now everything comes to an end at this point in time that mm. was all of that in vain? And Well, I guess, I guess that's normal in all relationships. That's what happens in all other relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We make all sorts of sacrifices um, when we love but, each other. And then some marriages last for a lifetime, others mm. just don't because then people grow as we grow. Like you're saying, mm. we continuously are either others will recline back into what they already know or some mm. of us like myself continuously are out there seeking to answer this question of what more exists of me? What other layers of myself have I not pe peeled away? What more experiences of the mm. self do I still want to have? And whether the other party would want to be a part of that. Mm. After all you've gone through and what you've been through, I think I have a definition of a woman mm. uh, from having interacted with women and having married one. Hell yeah, yeah a very beautiful one, one for that matter. <laughs> yes, she's beautiful. No, she is. She no. really is. Uh, so, 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 um, at, at, at the same time, uh, I think my understanding is is acquired. Yeah. All right, it's acquired. But um, maybe I'd like to understand from you, maybe, how do you perceive that yeah. question, which has been asked globally, like, what is a woman? Yeah. Much like you can even send, take it next level and say, what's a queen? Um, a, a woman is first and foremost that very entity itself that sees itself as a woman. Because many a times the question is asked with a, an ideal of wanting to confer those mm. traits on somebody mm. to then confer a particular qualification that you are a woman. Mm. You have to identify first and foremost yourself as a woman. You need to see yourself as occupying the space of a woman, functioning in terms of the role of a woman. Mm. And a woman, in my own understanding, and this is borrowed from the queens that raised me, the lionesses, Bara Khositao, it's been understanding the role and function of a woman in terms of her relation to the environment that she occupies. Mm. How does she exercise her power? How does he, she exercise her femininity? How does she exercise her own maternal instinct in relation to other people? Mm. So in... in, in just that kind of a wrapping. I, I would say a, a woman is somebody who nurtures. A woman mm. is somebody who cares. A woman is somebody who brings together. Many a times, like you said, conservative males and men have often been at times very antagonistic, militant, and women often are much more gentler and they're much more community builders, family builders in bringing people together. Yes, there are men who have mm, some sort of... Clearly, seen Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Uh, the last question, the last question, but Margaret Jackson, Thatcher was the juxtaposition, yes, and then um, the juxtaposition had to um, a Michelle Bachelet, for instance. Of course. Yeah, she's done um, incredible things for UN women. Yes. And it's, it's that kind of gentleness that we've seen in people mm. like Jacinta, who was the prime minister to New Zealand during COVID. Mm. And what we learned about women and women leadership mm. was how women-led nations actually responded better. Like Finland, uh, yes, they like, they, they responded women, yes mostly. because there's a certain level of femininity now, speaking, speaking that about, women speaking lead Speaking about with. those two elements that you are bringing, be that that I've mentioned, Finland. You know that Botswana has been categorized uh, as the most unhappiest nation mm. uh, in the Gallup report uh, consecutively. In many times, we are top yeah. five. I just want to honor our closing before we go. 
how do you relate with such a report? What does it mean to you? What does the notion of happiness mean to you ultimately at the end of the day, given the context of uh, your existence in this society? And um, how do you interpret the definition of happiness? Absolutely. I, I think happiness is, is one, very subjective, two, very relative as well at times. But there are certain determinants of happiness that when you bring it closer to the context of a Botswana, um, are really, 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 I, I think, stark for us to be able to acknowledge. And it's the, this concept I often talk when I speak about Botswana, that we're a rich state, but we are a poor nation. And what that means is when you start understanding you know, from the basics of social studies, the state is the institution, the governance and the structures that then run this institution called the state. And then there's the nation, which are the people themselves. And often in the Botswana context, I've often, even from my own personal experience as a trans person, there's a disconnect at times about what this supra-state or supra mm, structure I, I itself... I don't want you to... to, to, to... Uh, what it gives you as a person. Me. I want you to simplify yes. it to me. Yep. Yeah. And what what when the we happiness sit, yes. defines to you. When you sit with a state that you know has been living off of the riches of our diamonds and we've got reserves abroad that have never been tapped into really that much, mm -hmm. but we continuously are seeing a quarter of the country living inside of mud hearts, for instance, mm -hmm. where we continuously are seeing the throngs of children that have to walk distances to school on barefoot on top of everything. How then do we expect a nation like that to be a happy one? where it knows for sure that there are resources and they exist. But those resources do not necessarily translate into any kind of sustainable livelihoods, formidable livelihoods, happy livelihoods. And what is happy? You cannot be happy when you're not free. You cannot be happy when you are disregarded. You cannot be happy when you're not provided for or you're not protected. And it is why then, for a greater part, those that find themselves on the margins of society, those that find themselves in minoritized status, like in this country, for instance, we still have where there are certain ethnic minority groups that continuously have to just somehow push to just have a certain level of an equal, equal um, kind of status and representation. Put it an example low. We have an Nkuyadu Kosi right now. There are certain Zona tribes that have just this conferred right to have representation in the yeah. house of, of yeah. Ibadu Khosi. And then there are certain tribes mm. in this country that must apply to the Minister of Local Government to have their Khosis yeah. recognized. Right. I mean, that, is, that yeah. is an inequitable kind of dichotomy in a society that is certain, some, supposedly a free, accommodating, loving and accepting mm. society mm. because mm. there is a juxtaposition there of lived reality and experience and what the state purports itself as its ideals. Because we've had a vision 2016 and now it's a vision what, 2015 but is, is it a progressional issue or we are I, stagnant? I think we're stagnant. We're stagnated because if we're still at this point in time mm -hmm. battling with just the concept of why it's important for a child in primary school to be taught in their mother tongue. Mm -hmm. In a country like ours that has more than 19 vernacular languages, mm -hmm. it, it begs the question of who is in the majority then, then, and then in, program then, for. Then in this context, what would you like to see as the slogan for the next elections? A free Botswana for all that live in Botswana. And not just for all that's on, for all that live in Botswana. And when I speak about that, I'm also talking to a Botswana who identifies a Botswana. I'm talking about the Botswana that have been amalgamated into a Botswana that are not necessarily from Botswana speaking tribes. I'm also speaking about how we get to also treat non Botswana people who are from different um, countries and nationalities. I heard a very problematic statement made by um, an MP this morning on radio who was speaking, I think it's for the Francistown constituency, speaking about about how crime is rampant in his constituency and it's mostly the foreigners. And I live in South Africa, that's where xenophobia, how xenophobia is born, mm. law. Mm. And until we live in a society that really not only acknowledges the differences between people, but it celebrates them and protects those differences and mm. harnesses them, we have not gotten any far because that's why we are surprised that we don't even have cultural tourism in, in Botswana, mm. whereas we've got such cultural diversity. And it's because we've not designed even our, our economics in such a way that 
that they harness those very cultural differences, mm -hmm. those linguistic differences, those sexual and gender differences. Mm -hmm. Because the world right now is living with something called the pink dollar, and that's the spending What's power. The, the spending power of LGBTI people. How it it it, wait, it, it comprises wait, seven wait, billion. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. There's the pink dollar. This is for our next. <laughs> Uh, this for our next. This for our next. This for our next episode. We don't want people to discover the pink dollar before us. Oh my God! <laughs> before us, we want to this have is, yes. now have a discussion about the pink the dollar. The pink dollar. Because I'm um, told that there's a. And then in South Africa, no they, call it, they call it the it. pink rand. Okay. Um, so what about the pink pula? The so, spending power of LGBTI people. Yes. And even the creative abilities of LGBTI people that we are not harnessing in order to make a contribution towards our GDP. How many of mm -hmm. creatives are queer? What do you mean the creative power of the LGBTI so, people? Uh, just there's, there's a way in which LGBTI LGBT. culture or queer ah. culture has influenced what I would say popular culture. Mm. Look at videos of people like Madonna, like Beyonce, the kind of musical sets they develop for their music videos, the kind of choreographies that now go on, and even the embodiment of queer bodies as some of their backup dancers on stage. That comes from something called voguing that was actually evoked by LGBTI community, particularly gay men, who then were able to transcend the masculinity of, of, of their bodily construct to be able to actually do these very incredible moves that ideally were then copied and have influenced popular culture. So there is that influence, including about fashion. A lot of fashion trends are influenced by the selection of fashion buyers and fashion designers that are queer. A lot of tourism in and of itself, or what we see as friendly places to visit, as welcoming places to visit, is often borrowed off of whether they are also even LGBTI welcoming. And as such, where LGBTI, if we were to follow where LGBTI people travel to, mm. we would be able to see ways in which we can be able to create establishments that are able to attract more of that expenditure even within our own country. How, how much Does Botswana, for instance, you, low? Do you okay. know if we have a queer I've, joint? I've, I've, I've never, Do we have an LGBTI place in Botswana? We have those that yes. say we are LGBTI if, friendly. Yeah. But we don't have um, a queer joint that says we are a queer joint that actually attracts even heterosexual people into its establishment. Yeah, brilliant. It's often the I'm opposite. I'm quite curious there. I think you are onto something there that is quite quite uh, um, interesting. Um, in that pink dollar queer community, yeah. queer uh, GDP, as you say, yeah. I've never heard of um, uh, maybe Kalanga GDP. Yes. Sarah GDP, we need to harness. Yes. Uh, Tawana GDP, we need to harness. But that's cultural but, but, tourism. Yes. We are harnessing the cultural may, may, prowess maybe, of Maybe it's of not knowing or of ignorance. Yes. I'm just trying to say, maybe help me reconcile that now I'm hearing of uh, harnessing the LGBTQTI GDP yes, into the and society. economical and prowess. Mm, just knit it. For nicely you. for me so that I, I get to understand exactly so when you study global economics um mm. the world gdp about seven billion of contribution comes from the spending power of lgbti globally what? of lgbti people yes yeah, seven billion so <laughs> the kind of posh cars that you can be able to design to attract lgbti people to be able There's to an purchase actual study on that there is there is the Global Index Inclusion Index, LGBTI Inclusion Index. So are you and saying that's what LGBTQ communities are more spenders than they are, they, they Not that they are more spenders, but there yeah. is a, spend, a, a, a spending oh, power okay. that Around we, in, in spaces where we do mm. not create an environment that is conducive for LGBTI people, many uh, people exit those spaces to spend that money that they have in where spaces where there's freedoms elsewhere. for themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a uh, Botswana, for instance, that decriminalized homosexuality just now in 2019 and subsequently in the High Court of Appeal in 2021, has now a huge as potential to be able to harness that spending power of LGBTI people. Many of my community goes on holidays and it's often about going to places that you know will be LGBTI friendly. Places that are not, they're not going to be able to harness that pink dollar.
Damn. It's that simple. Now that's the economics of yes. your LGBTQI. Which is why um, then there are countries like uh -huh. your Malta, your even South Africa that have queer joints, places like Amsterdam, where you even have the the uh, the gay village itself. It's a whole entire street low that has yeah. joints or uh, establishments that say we are not just LGBTI welcoming or friendly. We are in actual fact an LGBTI joint. So if you want to come and have fun with the LGBTI community in a space where you're free, come through and that's how then we harness the pink dollar. Okay, you're not taking over my show. <laughs> um, this is my show. I'm going to close it down the way I want to close it. And don't tell me about the spending power. We are going to go into that. Uh, yes. It's quite brilliant. I think I've, I'm educated more than I was before I came here. And I would like to believe that we are going to continue engaging in more and Absolutely. more of these issues. You owe me a conversation on all these letters and all these dialogues, <laughs> bosses, gender, bo pro ops and Absolutely. whatnot. I believe when we get the right time, we'll come back again and just try to get ourselves educated to understand more about uh, our society and our community and, and, and the people we live with. Um, I just like to say... Uh, thank you, Ricky, for coming through. And thank you, Ricky, for being such a fire brand. I've learned quite a lot of from you. Pleasure. People will be surprised why you are my first guest. It's because yeah. I, I was know curious. I have the trust that I will learn something that I don't know. That I know. If I don't know it, a lot of my people who are knowledge seekers, who are the followers of the podcast, don't know. Don't know so I well. want us to learn more. This is Tsepor Kosidao. She's a seasoned human rights advocate, researcher, trans personality, feminist, sexual and reproductive health rights specialist. She's a pan Africanist by right. Yeah. She's a fashion designer, a theologian, and a social entrepreneur, and um, a queer theology scholar. Yep. But I most and foremost, that. I met her when she was a columnist and working with yes. me. But we are going to be having more discussions that are open-minded, that are going to be teaching us more about things that even either us don't know about. But we have to be more open as a society and get to learn different perspectives, different discussions, different aspirations from different people. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lawrence Serete. I'm out. This is The Punchline. Thanks.